Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, der Mensch, wir alle sind Spieler. Ohne unseren Spieltrieb, ohne den Spaß am und die Fähigkeit zum Spielen gäbe es keine Dichtung, keine Kultur und auch keine Wissenschaft, sagt der niederländische Kulturhistoriker Johann Heusinger. Spielen ist, folgen wir seiner Theorie, seit jeher eine Kategorie menschlichen Verhaltens. Menschen spielten und spielen, um sich zu unterhalten, sich in der Gemeinschaft zu zerstreuen, aber auch, um sich miteinander zu messen. Spiele wurden und werden aber auch eingesetzt, um Wissen in anregender Form zu vermitteln, um komplexe Sachverhalte verständlich zu machen. An diesen und an anderen Gründen, warum gespielt wird, mag sich durch all die Zeiten nicht viel geändert haben. Eines hat sich aber entscheidend verändert, und zwar die Art und Weise, wie wir heute spielen. Heutzutage sind digitale Spiele fester Bestandteil unserer Alltagskultur. Sie sind nicht nur ein großer Wirtschaftsfaktor, sondern auch Motor für Innovationen und Zeugnis zunehmender Digitalität. Unter Anwendung neuester Technologien entführen sie uns in die virtuelle Realität. Sie simulieren eine Vielzahl von Erfahrungswelten und Situationen, gegenwärtige, meist zukünftige, aber eben auch vergangene. Was liegt also näher, als sich im Rahmen dieser Vortragsreihe mit solchen digitalen Spielen mit ihrem besonderen Potenzial und ihrer Wirkung zu beschäftigen? Sehr geehrte Damen und Herren, ich begrüße Sie damit zu unserer zweiten Veranstaltung von Alte Welt neu formatiert, altertumswissenschaftliche Forschung im Zeitalter des digitalen Wandels. Einmal durch das alte Ägypten oder das antike Griechenland wandeln. Kein Problem, digitale Spiele machen das und vieles mehr heutzutage möglich. Die Firma Ubisoft, größter europäischer Videospielproduzent, hat mit seiner Serie Assassin's Creed zweifelsohne in diesem Bereich Maßstäbe gesetzt. Elf Hauptspiele sind mittlerweile auf dem Markt, zwei davon verlegen die Handlungen in die Antike. Mit großer Detailgenauigkeit wird die alte Welt virtuell rekonstruiert und eine fast perfekte Illusion geschaffen. Eine Illusion, die ihresgleichen sucht und Einfluss auf das Geschichtsbild derer nimmt, die diese Spiele spielen. Falls sie nicht oder noch nicht dazugehören, vielleicht hier nur eine Zahl, damit sie die Größe der Fangemeinde besser einschätzen können. Und zwar hat Ubisoft bisher von der Assassin's Creed Spielreihe ungefähr 140 Millionen Spiele verkauft. Von dieser beeindruckenden Reichweite können die Altertumswissenschaften natürlich nur träumen. Mit dieser beeindruckenden Reichweite ist aber auch eine gewisse Verantwortung verbunden. Und Ubisoft wird dieser Verantwortung vor allem mit den spielbegleitenden Discovery-Touren gerecht. Anspruch ist dabei, Geschichte nicht nur so originalgetreu wie möglich erlebbar, sondern durch Hintergrundinformationen auch verstehbar zu machen. Ubisoft hat mit seinen Discovery-Touren wahre digitale Freilichtmuseen erschaffen, die einen sehr interessanten, ganz neuen Zugang zur Geschichte bieten. Ladies and Gentlemen, I'm happy to introduce you to our speaker, Maxime Durand. Maxime studied history at the University of Montreal and began working at Ubisoft straight after graduating. His role as Assassin's Creed franchise historian began with Assassin's Creed III, And since then, he has collaborated on most of the brand's games and projects. Maxime has been part of the Discovery Tour educational games since its creation. And I was lucky enough to attend a preview of the Ancient Greece Discovery Tour and was blown away by the style and the complexity of it, as well of its potential for reaching out to groups of people who are not normally interested in ancient history or ancient research. I'm very excited to hear what he has to talk to us about today. History for all, how Assassin's Creed expanded into the education sphere. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, as you have already noticed, I will not dis give this lecture in German. I do apologize. Uh, I think we would be a very uh, would be very short of words to be able to describe all that I have to say today. Hopefully, you will understand with my uh, French Canadian accent. Um, so I will try to make it uh, to make the best out of it. Um, so today, I'll present to you a little bit how we work at Ubisoft on the Assassin's Creed franchise. I uh, will explain a little bit more about the Discovery Tour, as stated, and we will play the game, basically. 
if uh, if you do have questions, please keep them in your mind. Uh, we will take a, a lot of time at the end to try to answer as many of them as possible. Okay, uh, it is very strange to put a picture of yourself on the screen, but I do want to tell you a little bit more about uh, how I got this job and why I'm here today. Um, the first answer is that I was very lucky. Sometimes at life, that makes the whole difference. Um, I studied history at University of Montreal, just like many other candidates who, back in 2010, applied for the position of historian at Ubisoft, a position that didn't exist before. And I will explain a little bit uh, later on um, how that evolved. Um, maybe I, some of the things that I do believe made the difference uh, with, between me and the other candidates uh, was not that I had a diploma. We all had the same diploma in history. Uh, but I think what made the difference was uh, the experience that I had in museums as a guide, the experience that I had uh, in working into uh, other types of companies also, like selling outdoors equipment. It might sound silly, but uh, in comparison to someone else, when I had to explain to the company if I could speak in front of people, if I could explain things, it was much easier if I said I had experience than, than if I didn't have any experience. And then other, uh, other historians didn't have that experience as well. So anyhow, enough about this. Let's move on to the interesting stuff. Uh, how do we work on Assassin's Creed? Uh, I, will, I will do a, ve a very quick quiz. Uh, as who has played Assassin's Creed or seen Assassin's Creed before? Please raise your hand. Okay, so I, I do acknowledge that not everyone in the room has played or seen Assassin's Creed. That's quite all right. Uh, no offense taken, personally. Um, I do hope I will convince you otherwise to maybe get interested in, in it afterwards. So, in a nutshell, Assassin's Creed is an action-adventure game that we have started at Ubisoft back in 2007. It was, um, it was an evolution of an other game that we used to make that was called Prince of Persia. And so it tells it was settled in Persia, and so our first game was uh, was a, a new was creating a new genre of video game. We were realizing that back then, and uh, so we changed the name. We created something new, and it was set in the Third Crusade around Jerusalem and Damas, so in the Middle East. I can tell you, in 2007, creating a game where the main character is an assassin was, I guess, something very special, very uh, unique. Yet the game functioned very well because it was not promoting people to assassinate others. Uh, it was talking about the, uh, the sect of the Ashashan. Uh, it was talking about history. And it was the first open world genre of, of that era. So where you can go anywhere, you can climb on buildings, you can see monuments in a 3D way that was unlikely uh, un unseen before. So ever since that period, we've created other games that talk about many different eras. We've covered the Italian Renaissance. Again, maybe not the first thing you would come, that come to your mind when you want to create a, an action-adventure game, but it was a great success. Then we move on to games regarding the colonial era. So we've created games that were set in the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the uh, Golden Age of Piracy in the Caribbean. And we also did the Industrial Era in London. Then we jump back in time and uh, we released a game about Egypt at the time of the Ptolemaic era, at the end of uh, Queen Cleopatra's reign. And our latest game is set during the Peloponnesian War in Greece. So to do this, uh, what we do is we do a lot of research. Basically, the way that we work is that we are hundreds of developers on the Assassin's Creed series that are located worldwide in different studios. I'm from Ubisoft Montreal, which is usually the lead studio on the franchise. And technically, we, we start with a team of about 10 people, 12 people. These are di directors of the project. They are audio directors, uh, artistic directors, design directors. And from the start, on an evolution of about three or four years, they will define a game uh, from the historical era. And at the end of the process, they will have a full game ready for launch and ready for play. So when we define that we want to, to make an a historical era, for instance, let's say we, uh, when we wanted to do Egypt at the time of Cleopatra, we, didn't, we did not start with, with monographies of 1,000 pages with no pictures. Uh, 
Uh, it might interest me as a historian, of course, uh, but for the art director, it doesn't tell him anything. So we always start more on the, uh, on the entertainment side. We try to see what has been done before, movies, TV series. Uh, for instance, you could not release a game about ancient Egypt at the time of Cleopatra without acknowledging that the, the, the TV series Rome had been published a couple of years before. So it was important to understand that people already have expectations. They might already have uh, an, a visual example of what ancient Egypt might have looked like. So for the whole team, we start with that. We start with novels, books, TV series, movies. And uh, that gives us a first idea, a general idea of, of an historical era. And then the more we go forward, the more we work with, uh, with specialists. So um, I'm not a specialist of antiquity. I was, I was trained for 80th century in colonial America. That has nothing to do. Um, but we do every time work with other historians. We hire consultants, most of them professors or uh, curators from museums, uh, for all the different specialities. So we, we could hire someone uh, more on the terms of, of, um, of uh, events, characters, or we can hire people that are more about the language if we want to recreate, for instance, uh, an, an ancient Egyptian type of language for our game. Um, we also work with communities. It's important for us to understand, again, that this game is, is not meant to be played by people from the first century before our, our era. It is meant to be played by people who are actual people. Uh, so sometimes history has some sensitive subjects. Uh, so for instance, when we created a game where our main character was Native American, we did work with a community that we were actually representing in the game because these communities still exist today and they face and struggle because of these events from 300 years ago. So we work with the community, we try to understand uh, what was taboo for them, uh, we, and we try to get inspiration also from them. So what are the legends, the myths from, from their societies that they can bring forward and that history sometimes uh, don't pay attention to because it's not recorded, for instance. Uh, we work with musicians, um, we re record our music with orchestras and stuff like that. Uh, whenever possible, we visit the sites of the places that we are trying to reproduce. Uh, sometimes it's, it's very nice and it's easy because it's either very close or uh, the place hasn't changed that much. Uh, but in some, in some cases, for instance, with ancient Egypt or even with uh, New York, New York City, it has changed so much that for the team, there's not a lot of added value in going, in going into the place. It's maybe better to put our efforts into working with archaeologists, for instance. So I want to give you some examples of how we work and how we decompose material. So this is an example from Boston, uh, from our game set in 2012. I mean, released sorry, in 2012, but that is set in the colonial era of the American Revolution. So in a case like this, it's not too complex for us to recreate the building. This is the old state house. So the main, the, one of the main landmarks for the American Revolution in Boston it has changed a little bit uh, between the past and today, but not that much. So as you can see, the, it was quite easy to reuse the actual model and then to uh, also reuse historical data to be able to uh, rearrange the monument so that it looks very close to what it might have been like during the American Revolution. So that's quite an easy scenario. In some cases, however, we, we do have a lot of constraints. We are not reproducing a documentary. So when we're creating the Assassin's Creed game, we're reproducing what we call a sandbox, an area of play. Um, our metrics are different than real life. Uh, so we cannot always take, uh, we cannot reproduce everything faithfully, even if we knew everything. We have to adapt. But we also want to adapt because we have artistic values that we want to share. So in these examples, you have a picture on the left that is taken from a tourist, which represents the Sudak Fortress in modern-day Turkey. It's a very faithful reproduction of what the fortress looked like when they took the picture. But it doesn't convey much. It doesn't convey much emotion. Um, it might have been taken by, taken by a, a tourist, by a family, we don't know, but it doesn't tell us much. Whereas with the painting on the right side, we can see that they've played with the proportions. It's not respectful of what we've se we're seeing on the left, but there's an, a huge emotion that we can feel here, something. So we play with, with emotions like this on Assassin's Creed. 
Sometimes we can realign a street so that you can see a building from afar, so that you can both orientate yourself to, towards the building, but also, let's say, uh, let's take this Notre Dame de Paris in Paris. Uh, back then, you didn't have a straight way to get to the cathedral. It was all narrow streets. Uh, so in the game, we adapted the streets so that you can always see the cathedral from a distance, so that it really strikes you how big it is instead of waiting for the, the player to get in front of it and then being struck. All right. I will ask you to raise your hand and defining which is the real Saint-Chapelle in Paris and which is the game version of the Saint-Chapelle in Paris. So if you do believe that the real Saint-Chapelle in Paris is the one on the left, please raise your hand now. OK, you can lower your hand. If you do believe that the real Saint-Chapelle in Paris is the one on the right side, please raise your hand now. I, I think we have a tie here. Um, <laughs> that's very good. So it's, it's, here you have a very clear example of uh, not reconstitution uh, that is faithful, but rather credibilism, something that is possible. So on the left side, you have the real Saint-Chapelle in Paris. The glasswork is made by hand. It's unique. On the right side, the glasswork is repeated, uh, has been made by an artist, in a couple of hours, not a couple of years. Um, so you can see that it, it looks like it, it feels like it, but it's not totally faithful. So some buildings like this, we play, we play with our modules um, to make it feel like it. And, and so, uh, of course, when you're, uh, when you're stabbing pixels, or when you're killing pixels, you might not notice that. OK. I've said that our map is adapted. Here is another example from uh, our game that we wanted to set in ancient Egypt. We were interested in four different regions, in Egypt and Libya, to tell the story of the Ptolemaic era. So mostly the delta of the Nile. We were interested in uh, Kyrene, the, uh, the old Greek colony. We were interested in the oasis of Siwa, so very far in the desert where Alexander the Great is said to have been and uh, promoted as a god and a legi legitimate ruler of Egypt, and the Qatara Depression. So we were interested in these four places mainly, but there was a big issue is that they're very far away, thousands of kilometers or hundreds of kilometers away, whereas our game is about 20 kilometers by 20 kilometers. So. That's what we do. We, uh, we play with proportions. We keep the orientation. We try to make something that is credible. But we create a network between locations um, that still aims at different places, like Alexandria, Memphis, Crocodilopolis, or Kyrene. We study the uh, topology. So we want to make sure that, there's, that what we're offering the player is, is pretty different everywhere that you are going. So you have different depths. For instance, the Katara Depression, when it lowers, it's lower than the ocean level. When you go into the Giza Plateau, it starts to, to rise, for instance. So that doesn't feel like it's a flat map. It's very important. So we create volumetric maps like this one. We study also the biomes, so the nature. Uh, we try, I, I mean, sometimes it's, it's crazy because uh, we might have some misconception about Egypt, feeling that it's only sand. Of course, if it had been only sand, there would not have been civilization as we know it today. It was a very lush environment, but also very diverse. Uh, and so we studied that with the team. We uh, also use, when it, whenever it's possible, uh, NASA metrics for the colors that we can reproduce in the game. And so all in all, we take the locations that are interesting for us. We look at the volumes. We look at the different environments. And this is how we can come up with a map like this one for ancient Egypt. So it's still people things are sorry things are still placed in an order that makes sense. But of course, the distance doesn't make any sense. You could not see the lighthouse of Alexandria from the pyramids. It, it was just too far away. Um, but you can in the game at least you can orient it yourself. And I don't feel as a historian that we're 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 uh, uh, telling a lie to players as much. So every game has a new challenge in terms of historicity. Uh, sometimes we have maps that are quite complete, so we can reproduce them quite faithfully. 
Uh, so Rome and Boston are, are a good example. Uh, Rome has evolved quite a lot. Boston, the same. It used to be almost an island. And nowadays, if you go to Boston, you almost don't notice that there's water. Uh, un un unless, until you get to the aquarium and then you're, you're like, wow, okay, there's a big ocean just in front of us. Um, when we were trying to reproduce the Caribbean Sea, it was, it was quite easy also for us, even though it has changed a little bit because of earthquakes and so on. And other places like Constantinople were quite a big challenge too because the ar archaeology was quite fragmentary for us. Uh, a lot of, but when we created that game back in 2011, um, we realized also that a lot of documents and history are, were published in Turkish. Sadly, we were not Turkish speakers. I was not, I'm still not today, but we tried to make the most out of it still. Um, here we're gonna decompose uh, Wall Street, New York. So Wall Street has changed quite a lot. If you've ever been to New York today, I, you might not feel familiar with that view here. Um, maybe the only thing that, that is actually standing in that view today is that the Trinity Church that is at the end of the street that burned during the American Revolution has been replaced by the actual Trinity Church that still is there today. So in a view like this one, uh, because New York has evolved so much, we had to be quite creative in the, the way that we would approach the creation of the city. So we knew that that part of New York was, old, uh, was the new Amsterdam, so we look mostly at, at uh, a Dutch archi architecture to reproduce our buildings. Uh, we looked at a lot of references from museums that do recreation. Uh, so here the, the cart on the left is from Colonial Williamsburg in Virginia, which is uh, a live history museum from the 80th century. We look at costume books um, without, tell, without uh, uh, quoting them. The Osprey series is very useful for, for the team. Because again, the idea here is that um, when we do the research with, with the team, we have hundreds of developers that are not historians. They're artists, they're audio designers, they're game designers. So they have to see something that is very visual, very strong, so that they can reproduce it in the game. Yet we can. Uh, use uh, archives like the Cri de Paris. So we have a lot of visual evidence of, for instance, of what people were doing in the streets of Paris uh, in the 18th century during the French Revolution. So it was, it was quite easy to portray that in the game. Uh, because you have to imagine again that these people on the street that are recreating the past are technically actors in a black room with a black suit with white dots. Maybe you've seen that on television before. And they have to emulate that they're in Paris in, back in those days, either brooming the street or selling brooms. But they have no props on themselves. They're just em like actors with an empty spot. So we, we try to give them a lot of material so that they can feel like they're reproducing something. And it's the same with examples like these ones. Uh, we use votive models uh, a lot for our game on ancient Egypt because um, it, was, it was still accurate in the, in the technique that Perhaps we could use, but also it was very visual and, and quite interesting to model that into the game. Um, the, you might realize that the, an, the animations are not perfect there. Like when they're, they're, he, they're putting beer or water, it's, it's, it's not 100% perfect always because it wasn't meant for players to pay so much attention on them. It's meant for you to normally to be running after Perhaps other people enemies and attacking them or <laughs> finding your way to, uh, I guess, to assassinate other people. And um, normally you're not looking at these elements, but still we're trying to make them very precise so that when you're, if you're stopping and you're paying attention, you still feel like they're doing something that is quite close to what they should have been doing. Um, and you have to imagine that we have to do hundreds and hundreds of animations like these uh, just to populate the world to make it credible and interesting. I've explained a little bit about how we do the uh, research process, how we adapt it to the game. And uh, now I want to explain how we came with the Discovery Tour idea. So the idea is that uh, ever since the first Assassin's Creed, we realized that there was a potential. Um, there was a potential of, of, of people liking history because they, they played a video game. Uh, it was something that we understood very quickly on. Uh, but we felt that because we're adapting history, because our game is not a documentary, it's really an adaptation for f entertainment, uh, we deserve to do more. 
So ever since the second Assassin's Creed game, we started introducing the Animus database. So when you were playing, for instance, you were arriving in Florence, uh, you were getting in front of, of, uh, of a church, for instance, then the game would tell you, oh, here there's a note about the church. Do you want to open the note? So you could open the note. You could learn about historical characters. You could learn about uh, different sites with a small encyclopedic entry. Um, it wasn't perfect, but it was already a, a first good step. And so we've, we've done that ever since the second Assassin's Creed until our game set in 2015, what, what, which was in the, the uh, Industrial Revolution. After that moment, we had decided already that we would not do it anymore, and we wanted to do something new, something better. We had to evolve. And so this is how we came up with the idea of creating the discovery tour. I will show it to you after, so um, I'm asking you for, for your patience. Um, so the way it unfolded is that we, we launched our game on ancient Egypt in uh, October of 2017. And in February of 2018, so a couple months after, we launched what we call the Discovery Tour Ancient Egypt. It's a, a tool that we made that is adapted from the main game to be accessible by everyone. So our Assassin's Creed games are meant for players, they're meant for entertainment, and we understand that it's not everyone that are gonna play these games. But we want to do a version that could be accessible for students, uh, for families, friends, people that are interested or curious about history, but that would don't want necessarily to play the video game. And ever since we launched that Discovery Tour, it has been tremendously successful. Um, I, I've, with the team, we've worked on this for years, trying to understand how what, what could be the new evolution of, uh, of a conflict-free game or pressure-free game that could be interesting to talk about history. And I think we were expecting about half a million users. And today, we are at more than 2.3 million users that have played the Discovery Tour Ancient Egypt. So it, it, for us, it's a big mark of success. And it, it helps us internally to prove to the company that it's worth continuing and doing more of them. Uh, when we launched it, it was also a big mediatic success. Uh, it was actually one of the most important uh, uh, point in our uh, marketing campaign for Assassin's Creed. Uh, medias from everywhere uh, talked about it. Uh, I mean, again, medias could talk about anything else. They could talk about uh, crisis, social, economical uh, problems, but they decided even in mainstream medias to talk about history, to talk about the Discovery Tour. Uh, sometimes maybe going too far away, uh, we are not trying to replace teachers, of course not. But uh, it's some, uh, some media headlines were sometimes very ag aggressive. Um, we're very fortunate because the, uh, the, the teaching industry has recognized our project. So this year, this summer, we uh, have received the Best Learning Game Award at the Games for Change Award. It's, uh, it's a festival that is held in, in uh, New York City. I think it's been ongoing for uh, 20 years now. It's a festival by educators for educators regarding the use of video games. Uh, you have to imagine that 15 years ago, 20 years ago, the kind of video games that they had for education was uh, you had like a screen with a player with a, a basketball in the hand, and the game would ask you two plus two, and then if you had four, then you could score the net. So that's where we come from in terms of educational video game. Um, we're coming a long way. Uh, and so for, for us as an as a entertainment industry, to, to go and start to do an educational video game was not uh, an easy task, because we're not educators but we've worked with educators. Uh, so I'll show you some examples of what has happened with the first Discovery Tour, and then we're gonna play. But, um, so, mind this, sorry, this is in French, uh, but what we've done is that ever since 2015, we've discussed with uh, didactic professors, we've, we've dis uh, discussed with teachers in classrooms. We were trying to evaluate what was the need, how could we could adapt our game for the need of a school? How could we adapt our game for the need of a museum, for instance? Let's say a visitor in a museum comes in, they have five minutes to play the, 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 the educational game. They don't have time to learn how to do it. And in five minutes after that, they need to be in the next room because people have to continue moving on. Uh, but yet we've worked with, with teachers. We, uh, we have been trying and testing the game in the classroom before the launch, before publishing. And ever since, we're continuing to work with teachers and professors. Uh, so in this case, for instance, uh, this is um, 
a pedagogic uh, group. So this is a, uh, a governmental uh, group that have uh, looked at what we've created and they've tried to adapt it for the classroom. They've tried to create tasks around the, the use of the game so that the, the classrooms could use it. Uh, this is aimed for uh, students that are 12 to 14 years old. So for instance, they're asked to play a tour about the uh, hieroglyphs. So they go into the, the, the educational video game. They learn uh, through a tour about the hieroglyphs. And then on the side, they also have assignments with their teachers. So here, instead of having the teacher in front of the classroom that is telling the content of the hieroglyphs, the, the students can play at their own pace. And at the end, they can ask questions. They can, uh, they can uh, ask themselves questions also and try to find the answer. What, where in the game are hieroglyphs used, for instance? Um, why did the game use them? Why is it adapted? So we want to promote critical thinking through the use of the, of the discovery tour. Uh, last year, just in Montreal, around the, our studio, there's over 2,000 students that have used the discovery tour. And they are monitored by University of Montreal so that we want to know if it's uh, a useful tool or not. Uh, so in that last scenario, there were uh, 15 laptops that were shared between schools. Here in this scenario, it's one private school that has uh, quite a lot of money. And they've bought uh, high-end computers, gaming computers. So every student has the, its own computer when they arrive in the laboratory. Um, the funny bit here is that they didn't buy the computers because of this, the technology and science program. They bought it for the history program. And they lend it to the science program after that. Uh, anyhow, they have fun. Their teacher is, is not a gamer, but he understood the, the, the value of it. And he's made the most out of it. And uh, because they have quite a lot of money, they also flew to New York. Uh, and uh, after that, they went to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, where they were comparing the artifacts that we, we have used in the Discovery Tour and that we're showing to, to uh, the learners. And so, yeah, they, again, the goal here with the teacher is that they played the game, they, they, they became interested uh, in the classroom to history, or maybe they were already interested in history, but still, they used it as a mean to promote critical thinking and have the discussion in classroom. Games are not, uh, uh, games are not a, re a realistic representation of the past, so the, there needs to be this discussion in the classroom because students play video games. And so they, they have to ask themselves, why, why is the game adapted? How is it adapted? So they can have that discussion with the teacher. And again, here, instead of having a teacher as a speaker in front of the classroom, the role of the teacher is more to be a guide to help the students to find answers to their questions. So um, we're very lucky that we wanted to create a product that would be useful for museums, and it has been useful. Uh, we're, we've been able to, to do many partnerships in museums, um, either in France, uh, and in Germany, we've, uh, we've had, a, uh, I think, a display in uh, Bonn Museum last year, and it's, it's gonna continue. Um, there's uh, an exhibit that was created in Montreal with the artifacts from Leiden and Turin in Italy, and that is moving on now to different museums. And we were lucky enough to collaborate and create the environment for the exhibit. So you have all the artifacts that are great collections from these museums, but all the, the walls, the textures from the exhibit are from the game. So we, we extracted something special for them. So I'll give you just a, a, a short example. <laughs> Here we're trying to reproduce the village of uh, Deir and Medine, so the, the village, uh, the workers' village that built uh, the, um, the, uh, the uh, valley of the kings and the queens. One of the big challenges that we had is that the projected chair was 10 meters or 20 meters wide. And so uh, and they were placed in the back of the artifacts. So when people came in the room, we didn't want to overwhelm them with the projection. So we tried to play with the size and the, uh, the lengths. Anyhow, if you have the opportunity to go to Ottawa next year, it will be there. <laughs> um, 
another thing that is that is that always blows my mind as a as a historian is that people like history. I think people genuinely love history, but all forms of history are not always accessible to everyone. Um, I've mentioned it when I started talking that I do love monographies with more uh, note pages at the end than there is actually actual text in the book. It's very useful for historians, but and it is, it is not meant for for everyone to read. Uh, but I think people are interested in history, and and it shows. Um, it shows because. For instance, here it's a screenshot from a, a website that's called Reddit. Um, you might know you might know Reddit. You might not know Reddit, so I will explain. Reddit is uh, is a discussion page. Basically, people write uh, sometimes quite crudely, and they're very uh, honest, maybe too honest. And all of these pages have subsections, and there's a subsection about history that has 14 million users. 14 million users that talk about history on a web page with people that they don't know. It's, for me, it's always very impressive. And, uh, and thankfully for us, the, the most uh, upvoted article, because you can upvote art, uh, articles, uh, is about the Discovery Tour. Because again, I, I, there's a, I think there's, there's an appetite for history. And because history can be uh, accessible with the video game format, I think it answers a need. It doesn't replace the rest. It doesn't replace movies. It doesn't replace books. It doesn't replace teachers. It's just one additional tool that is there. Um, I've said it. It blows my mind every time. Uh, but we play with that also. So when we created the game on Ancient Egypt, uh, we wanted to play with the fans. We uh, decided to hide messages in hieroglyphic. And um, when, we, when we announced that we were doing this, uh, we just said, uh, look in the back, there's big wallpaper and there, there are hidden messages in there, maybe. And so in less than 48 hours, the thing that you see on the left is that fans started to collaborate on crowdsourcing using uh, social platforms like Twitter to try to decipher the messages in hieroglyphic. Um, so I'm sure here there are people that might read hieroglyphic. Would you raise your hand? Excellent. This is the best ratio I've ever had. <laughs> Last time it was uh, Dr. Simon. Um, usually there's nobody in the room or, or the consultant that's with, that's with me. Uh, I, I still don't know much. Uh, I've learned a little bit, but it's quite complex. Um, imagine that people could talk about anything. They could show pictures of their cats, but instead they're trying to decipher a dead language on, you, on like Twitter. It's, it's insane. Um, Ultimately, it took more than a year for, uh, for them to find all the messages. They had quite a lot of help from an archaeology student in Australia. Uh, but they've managed to decipher the, the messages. And if you know hieroglyphic, you understand that uh, one of the particularities of the language is that it can mean so many different things. And yet, they've been able to, to get the message quite right. Um, because we've seen that as, as a company, I'd say I'm, I'm, I'm very lucky because Ubisoft is not like many other video game companies. It cares. Um, so we realized that hieroglyphic uh, was very complex. There are not as many people that are studying it as it should. And there are way too many things to decipher, because you have thousands of years of hieroglyphic to, to try to understand. So we've partnered with Google and uh, different universities to try to do uh, an uh, um, uh, art artificial intelligence-based learning for hieroglyphic. So it's, uh, it's AI learning for the machine, for Google. And up so far, the uh, results are very promising. Uh, the, goal, the first goal of this is for um, uh, Egyptologists to, to be able to be faster at deciphering instead of trying to, to find what a symbol means because it's, it might be broken. They try to find a tool that will simulate what should be the, the most uh, reasonable symbol, for instance. So you, find you use less time to try to decipher and more time to try to uh, interpret. But the interesting bit of this is that ultimately the goal is to do Google Translate with hieroglyphic. And so we've asked, uh, we, have, we asked the help of, of the fans, of anyone that wanted to do it, to draw hieroglyphs on their tablets, on the computer, to help the artificial intelligence to understand that all of these images that are drawn by hand by people that are imperfect can be interpretation of the same symbol. Anyhow, uh, long story short, uh, I think we care, but we, 
uh, technology companies can do more, they, they can participate in digital humanities. All right, I've talked a lot about ancient Egypt without showing much. Now let's talk about ancient Greece and let's show some images. Um, so as I said, the first discovery tour was a huge success on our behalf, at least. And uh, thankfully, we had the chance to do a second one. And we la just launched it in uh, September last month. So I will start uh, the short video introduction that normally you would have when you start the discovery tour. Share. Du wirst dich gleich auf eine Entdeckungsreise durch die reiche und faszinierende Geschichte der alten griechischen Welt begeben. Bald tauchst du ein in die detailreiche Welt, die für Assassin's Creed Odyssey geschaffen wurde. Diese kannst du in deinem eigenen Tempo ohne Zeitdruck und ohne Gefahren erkunden. Du kannst aber auch eine der geführten Touren auswählen, die von prominenten Historikern und Archäologen kuratiert wurden. Unterwegs wirst du einige Worte mit den bekanntesten historischen Personen der griechischen Welt wechseln. Das alte Griechenland, welches du erkunden wirst, befindet sich in seiner Blütezeit. In dieser Epoche wurden großartige körperliche und geistige Leistungen vollbracht. Die architektonischen Wunder versetzen Besucher noch heute in Staunen. Während gewaltige Entwicklungen in der Philosophie, der Politik und Kunst unsere Gesellschaft tiefgreifend beeinflusst haben. Wir hoffen, dass dich die umwerfenden Reichtümer des alten Griechenlands begeistern und heißen dich herzlich willkommen. So, this new discovery tour is about ancient Greece. It, it's set in the Peloponnesian War era. And uh, again, we've worked with educators. We've tested the product before putting it into people's hands. And, uh, and I tell you, if, if I was one of those kids in the classroom when, uh, when we were doing this, I would have been very happy. Um, of, like, because when they're told that they're going to play a video game in the classroom, they just go nuts. They're super happy. So I can tell the motivation level is very high. Uh, the, the teachers said, and, and some of them were not convinced beforehand of using the tool, but some of the teachers said that they could, they could have left the room and let the students do their work because nobody wanted to go to the toilet anymore which is quite unusual. Normally everyone is, needs to go all the time. Um, so the way we work is that uh, we, uh, we created, we reused the map that was created for the game Assassin's Creed Odyssey. We uh, removed all the dead bodies, we hid all the blood, um, we, uh, we fed the bears and the lions so that they do not attack people anymore. Um, when you push someone now, they're like Canadians, they always say, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, but we also work with uh, historians. So the way is uh, that we have guided tours that take you to the reconstitution that, we've ha that we have. And so every time we try to work with, uh, with a, a very wide cast of, of uh, specialists, uh, depending on their uh, availabilities and so on and so forth. So uh, as much as we can, we work with the, the specialists that can really precisely give us the most up-to-date points about a precise subject. So how it works is that we had this huge map that was created by the team of Assassin's Creed Odyssey that was uh, originally uh, created with the help of Dr. Stephanie-Anne Ruetta, who's a classicist. And we printed out that huge map on, on the wall, on the team's wall. And then we, we put pins and we tried to, to, to say, where are the places that would be interesting as a tourist to visit in ancient Greece? to have a, a guided tour in ancient Greece. So we've mapped these all out on the, on the real map that we've printed on the wall. And then by hand, we were playing them. So we would open the game and we would say, for instance, here, that was our first test in the Delphi, in the sanctuary of the uh, Oracle. So we were playing, we were saying, okay, let's say we're going uh, forward. The interesting bit with Delphi is that we, because it exists today, because it has been dug out, uh, we, can, we could follow the same path that, that people take today. So it's quite close to, to be realistic. And, uh, and so on, we've created many tours like this. We asked the, we asked the different historians to write the content we, of the tours. We asked them to find also uh, um, 
artifacts from museums, from libraries that we could show that would enhance the experience and to link back to tr more traditional uh, mediums of history. And, um, and then when we received the texts, uh, I can tell you they were not that very good, all of them. Uh, historians are very good searchers, not always the best writers, unfortunately. Uh, this is not true to all of them, uh, myself included. Uh, but what we did is that we, uh, so we looked at all these tours that we received and we, we played them again with the text from the historians and we timed ourselves. And so whenever a tour would be longer than 15, 20 minutes, we would have to shorten it because nobody has enough attention for that for more than 20 minutes even 10 minutes is about the most you can get we're already 45 minutes now so thank you you're still here uh, but it's it's a big challenge to keep to keep people's attention and want them to continue to do the experience so we shortened the tour and we kept the most essential information uh, but what we did is instead of cutting away all the rest of the work that had been done by the historians that was interesting but too long we created uh, new stations that were independent from the main tours. So uh, these offered new opportunities for exploration, and now, and now I will show you them. One last part before I play. Uh, a very important thing for us is that the Discovery Tour had to be accessible in terms of content, and so whereas the main game is, is rated mature for adults, the Discovery Tour is rated Le Programme here in Germany, so it means zero and plus. Anybody can play it. And the rest of Europe, it's seven. In, uh, the, uh, in America, it's 10 years old. So first thing that people see here is that it's a work of fiction. It's adapted. It's not reality. So I've started the Discovery Tour. I get here to the, the, main, the main entrance. I just press A to start. And then I can, here I've put it in German. The Discovery Tour is available in uh, French, German, Italian, Spanish, Russian, Japanese, uh, traditional Mandarin, uh, simplified Mandarin, and Korean. So again, the goal here is that it can be published worldwide. It is, it's not meant only for the German audience or the American audience. So you, while you're waiting to get into the game, it's loading, you have some, some tips some historical information. Okay. So last time I've played, I was in uh, Olympia. So it's quite a nice place next to Ellis. Um, the Discovery Tour experience is that you get into the map Normally, you have an introduction video. You have a tutorial that tells you how to how to go around, how to play. Um, basically, what you need at minimum is a left thumb, and the two button here. That's the 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 very least that you need. There are a lot of options that are available, but it's not the first thing that we show to players when they start. So, players that are more uh, used to video games, they they grab it very quickly. Uh, newcomers to video game. They're not pub punished because they don't know how to how to act. So you get with you have an avatar here. I've uh, I've picked the Greek brute as we call it. Um, you have many characters that you can use. As you can see, he's a brute, uh, but very light-hearted. He likes po poetry. You can you can play as as a kid if you want, uh, or let's say. I want to play as a, as a Schmidt. Okay. So in front of me, I have the beginning of a tour that I can start. Here it's a tour about the gods of Olympia. I'm meeting one of the guides. Uh, in this case, this is going to be a fictive character, but we also have historical characters like Herodotus or Leonidas. And uh, the, the, on the left side of the screen, it tells me what this tour is going to be about, what is going to be the length, and how many stations I will go into. Can I raise the, the level? So I can ask him who he is. My name is Barnabas, and I 
ich bin Schiffsführer. Lass dich nicht von meinem Auge täuschen. Auch wenn ich in einige Kämpfe verwickelt war, halte ich mich heute eher an den Handel. Und für Leute wie dich bin ich auch Fremdenführer durch wundervolle Städten wie diese. Or ask him something more personal. Dieser Ort vibriert gewissermaßen vor göttlicher Energie. Es fühlt sich an, als würde mir Zeus persönlich ins Gesicht starren, wenn ich mich jetzt umdrehen würde. And then I can finally start the tour. Das Heiligtum von Olympia war Zeus gewidmet, dem König der Götter. Hier gibt es sehr enge Verbindungen zum Göttlichen, die du schon bald sehen wirst. Sobald du fertig bist, suche ich dich auf und wir reden darüber, was du gelernt hast. So, <laughs> um, there's a golden spine on the ground that tells me where to go. Um, so I, if I want, I can control the camera. I can look around or I can let the camera take control of the character also. So I don't need to control the camera, for instance, here, it, I'm just moving around. The goal is that, again, it's quite simple and easy. And I simply need to go and follow the spline if I want to, and get to the station where I will learn something. Diese Werkstatt wurde für den bekannten Bildhauer Phidias errichtet, nachdem er an der Akropolis von Athen gearbeitet hatte. Im Jahr 435 vor unserer Zeitrechnung kam Phidias nach Olympia, um die Arbeit an der großen chrys elefantinen statue von Zeus aufzunehmen. Er starb fünf Jahre später, kurz nach der Fertigstellung seines Meisterwerks. Diese große Statue wurde zu einem der sieben Weltwunder der Antike. Phidias' Werkstatt war direkt neben dem Tempel des Zeus. Ihre Struktur wurde gut erhalten, vor allem dank ihrer Umwandlung in eine Kirche im 5. Jahrhundert. Archäologen konnten viele antike Materialien in der Umgebung finden, wie zum Beispiel Gussformen und Bildhauerwerkzeuge. Das bekannteste Artefakt allerdings ist ein Becher mit der unmissverständlichen Inschrift Ich gehöre Phidias. So, at the end of the station, I can open a panel that tells me more information. So there's, uh, there's an artifact, a work of reference with the quote, with the, the number, so that, for instance, a teacher or uh, students can try to find that same reference in, uh, in an online collection. And then there's more text that tells you a little bit more, either about archaeology or about the place itself. And then we can simply get to the next station. So here, let's say I don't want to do the tour anymore, and I want to go around. I can do it. There's nothing uh, constraining for people. We can see it's Olympia. People are very merry here, very happy, uh, in front of the uh, olive tree of Zeus. Uh, if I want, instead, I can go straight to the, the temple. I can climb on places I don't think archaeologists would accept today. With reason, as a matter of fact. Uh, but also, it allows me to see the colors of the temples. <laughs> and it allows me to see something that is not always very accessible or very often misunderstood. Um, just showing temples with colors and what they could have looked like, even though it's not a perfect reconstitution, I think has a lot of value uh, in what people might have in terms of perspective. Of course, for a 12 years old that is going to play this, and if this is the only thing that they're ever going to see of Olympia, maybe this is the only representation that they will have in their head. But if you're using it in a, in a university classroom, for instance, and the goal is not so much for people to learn with the tours, then it is to ask students to criticize then you can have a very interesting discussion about representation of the past. Let's get back to our character. Um, I always wanted to see this. I've never been to Greece, I must admit. But 
I w always wanted to, do, to see the marvels of the ancient world. And so uh, here I am. And if I want, I might do again something that is quite inappropriate. Let's climb on the Zeus statue. So this is one of the potential that the, the game can offer. It's just to go see places, to have freedom to navigate, to elaborate. Uh, you might want to do the tour if you want. You might be too young, too young to do the tours and not interested. Uh, you can go on the white circles in the ground and let the, the uh, character take over, and then they might do some activities of the past. Uh, here they're quite actively worshipping, but if you, we're going to a, a, a winery, for instance, then you, you can see your own character trying to reproduce some of the st steps of winemaking. So the, the map is quite vast. Um, all of these dark icons are tours that we can play. So you can fast travel directly to them if you want. Or otherwise, all of these stars that we have here are contents that you can not only unlock when you travel to these sites. So we have hundreds of them. They are scattered throughout the whole map. And the goal here is to push people to explore, to see things and places that they might not go to. For instance, on Abea, we don't have any tour, but we have different sites that will tell about uh, either the island or some aspect of the island. All right. Um, who's ever been to Sparta? Lucky you. Let's go to Sparta. So we can only easily select to go to the tour, and it's automatic. Uh, the player doesn't need to progress to get into it. It's it's quite fast. So if you have uh, uh, if you have a limited amount of time, then it's it's quite easy to go there. And now we will meet our historical character, King Leonidas. Willkommen an dem Ort, an dem spartanische Jungen zu Männern wurden. Mein Name ist Leonidas. Ich war ein König von Sparta, halte mich aber deshalb nicht für einen vom Luxus verweichlichten Adligen. Zogen die Spartiaten in den Krieg, stand ich mit ihnen Schild an Schild. Mein Speer schmeckte dasselbe Blut wie die Speere meiner Männer. Er erinnert mich unweigerlich an den Jungen, der ich einst war. Ich frage mich, was er wohl heute von mir halten würde. Wäre er stolz, eingeschüchtert? Oder würde er diesen alten, müden Mann vor ihm umleiden? Doch solche Gedanken sind müßig. Gehen wir weiter. I, I can tell you that Herodotus is quite a different kind of personality than King Leonidas. Die Agoge war Spartas strenges Erziehungssystem. Sie nahm die Jungen unter ihre unerbittliche Obhut und formte sie, bis sie perfekte spartanische Bürger voller Stärke, Intelligenz und Entschlossenheit waren. Ich suche dich auf, sobald dein Besuch beendet ist. Dann sprechen wir weiter. Bis dahin. So, uh, of course, creating Sparta for uh, the team was a huge challenge because it's uh, quite fragmentary and the, uh, the accounts are very few. But still, it's, it's possible to create something that is, <laughs> that, is, that is realistic still or believable, you can say. Even though the, you can see that the, the statues are too big, the sizes are too large. Uh, you have to imagine also that the, the camera, the lens of the game is quite different than that of the human high. So in the game, often things tend to go to look smaller. If you take a picture, for instance, you always see that, that same process. If you use your phone to take a picture, uh, it's never as good as in real life. So with the game, we play with proportions to try to bring that and counterfact the uh, lens problem. Sparta war eine griechische Stadt in der Peloponnese. Im Gegensatz zu anderen Städten jener Zeit verfügte sie nicht über Mauern. Sparta bestand ursprünglich aus vier benachbarten Dörfern, Kenosura, Mesoa, Limne und Pitane. 
Sie alle verband ein gemeinsames politisches, militärisches und religiöses Leben. Nach zwei Kriegen gegen Messenien vergrößerte sich das Stadtgebiet weiter. Im 5. Jahrhundert vor unserer Zeit kontrollierte Sparta beinahe die halbe Peloponnes. So, yeah, quite different. Die Agoge war das militärische Trainings- und Erziehungsprogramm, dem sich Spartas männliche Kinder unterziehen mussten. Männer für den Krieg auszubilden, war eines der wichtigsten Ziele der Stadt. Das Training begann im Alter von sieben Jahren und endete mit Erreichen des 30. Lebensjahrs. Es heißt, dass spartanische Kinder schon kurz nach der Geburt auf ihre Tauglichkeit hin untersucht wurden. Waren sie zu kränklich, warf man sie in eine Schlucht. Diese Praxis konnte allerdings noch nicht nachgewiesen werden. Die gesunden Jungen galten als tauglich für die harte Ausbildung. Wenn sie das Eintrittsalter erreichten, verließen sie ihre Familien und traten in den Dienst des Staates ein. Zu ihrer Ausbildung gehörten das Lesen, Schreiben und auch Musizieren. In erster Linie wurden sie aber durch militärische Übungen geschult, die sie zu effizienten Soldaten machen sollten. Die Agroge teilte sich in drei Zyklen. Für Jungen zwischen 7 und 12, für Jugendliche zwischen 12 und 20 und für Männer zwischen 20 und 30. Jeder Zyklus beinhaltete spezielle Übungen, die Körper und Geist formen sollten. So, I will go and do the full tour because um, there's something that I cannot skip and that is waiting for us at the end of the tour. Sparta spielte eine wichtige Rolle beim Sieg gegen die Perser während der Perserkriege im 5. Jahrhundert vor unserer Zeitrechnung. Besonders hohes Ansehen genoss der glorreiche Tod ihres Königs Leonidas in der Schlacht bei den Thermopylen. Im Kampf gestorben zu sein, galt für die Spartaner als guter Tod. Leonidas habe unglaublichen Mut bewiesen. All dies galt für alle Spartaner als erstrebenswert. Diese idealisierte Tapferkeit war tief im kollektiven Gedächtnis der Stadt verankert und die wichtigste Tugend, nach der man in der Agoge strebte. So some of the questions that uh, teachers can ask their students to, to react to, for instance, when they're playing a tour like this one, is to compare with modern day uh, citizenship. Uh, to compare also with the, uh, the Athenian citizenship because there are tours regarding democracy in Athens back in the days and then to make comparison and to elaborate on that subject. Der erste Zyklus der Agoge konzentrierte sich auf Jungen zwischen sieben und zwölf. Den Jungen wurde der Kopf rasiert und sie trugen leichte Kleidung. Sie liefen barfuß umher, schwammen das ganze Jahr über im Fluss Eurotas, schliefen im Schilf und nahmen an den Ritualen zu Ehren der Artemis Ortia teil. Die Jungen wurden in Herden, sogenannte Agele, eingeteilt und von älteren Schülern beaufsichtigt. Sobald sie zwölf wurden, erreichten sie den zweiten Zyklus der Agoge. Hier sollten sie lernen, sich als Bürgersoldaten in die Gesellschaft einzufügen. Der zweite Zyklus war für Jungen zwischen 12 und 20 vorgesehen. Mit Erreichen des 20. Lebensjahres wurden die jungen Männer Hebontes genannt und konnten als Hobliten in der Armee dienen. Bis zum Alter von 30 lebten die Männer in Gemeinschaftsunterkünften, den Syskenia. Ab dem 22. Lebensjahr durften sie zwar eine Familie gründen, 30 galt allgemein aber als passenderes Heiratsalter. Die Spatiaten dienten bis zu ihrem 60. Lebensjahr in der Armee. Danach nannte man sie Älteste oder Geronten. Allerdings dienten viele dennoch weiter, wie etwa König Archidamos III., der bis zu seinem Tod in der Schlacht kämpfte. Er war zu diesem Zeitpunkt 62 Jahre alt. Alle erwachsenen spartanischen Männer nahmen an den Gemeinschaftsmahlzeiten den Zisidien teil. Dafür trugen die Teilnehmer jeden Monat eine bestimmte Menge Lebensmittel bei, sowie eine kleine Geldsumme für die Bezahlung des Fleisches. Jeder Mann hatte das Anrecht auf eine Mahlzeit, mit Ausnahme der Könige, die zwei Portionen erhielten. 
Die Teilnahme an den Zisidien war für jeden Spartiaten, der das Glück hatte, Teil einer Gruppe zu sein, verpflichtend. Die Mahlzeiten waren von politischer Bedeutung. Laut Xenophon und Plutarch dienten die Sizidien auch dazu, ein Gefühl der Gleichheit unter den Bürgern zu schaffen. Außerdem demonstrierten sie die Selbstbeherrschung und Mäßigung der spartanischen Gesellschaft. Aber in Wahrheit vergrößerten die Sizidien die bestehende Kluft zwischen den Armen und den Reichen. Denn wer sich den Beitrag nicht leisten konnte, war nicht nur vom Essen ausgeschlossen, er verlor auch seinen Status als Vollbürger. So I've been going quite fast through the tour and uh, normally, again, you have time to go around and, and, and look at the different things. Uh, for instance, look at the track where the students were at in the CCT, at the, the, uh, the uh, Agogi. So we, the tour is over, we get back to the, uh, our tour guide and he's waiting for us. Dein Rundgang ist beendet. Wie du gesehen hast, war die Agoge nichts für die Schwachen und Zartbeseiteten. Doch sie tat, was sie sollte. Sie brachte fähige Krieger und kluge Bürger hervor. Was möchtest du noch sehen? So at the end, we have different options. Either we can leave the tour, we can uh, go on, on a tour that is in the same type of subject, uh, or if we want, we can take a quiz, which is not mandatory, but it's quite fun. Du glaubst also, du wärst bereit für einen Test? Gut. Sehen wir, wie du dich schlägst. Zunächst eine einfache Frage. Aus wie vielen Zyklen bestand die Agoge? So, <laughs> we, are, we are always offer four options. And um, most of the guides, maybe not Leonidas, most of the guides, they will not punish you for the wrong answer. They will tell you why it is not the wrong answer. And then we try to reinforce uh, 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 learning through that process. So, I don't know, let's say here. Nein. Dann verbrechte man zu viel Zeit mit der Ausbildung und zu wenig mit dem Leben. Versuch's nochmal. Richtig, die Agoge bestand aus drei Zyklen. Für die Jungen zwischen 7 und 12, für die Jugendlichen zwischen 12 und 20 und für die Männer zwischen 20 und 30. Nächste Frage. Wie viele Portionen erhielten die Könige bei den Sissitien? Very important questions here. Mach dich nicht lächerlich. Wie soll ein König in den Krieg ziehen, wenn er sich kaum aus dem Thron erheben kann? Versuch eine andere Antwort. Here, just with comedy, we reinforce the fact that the Spartan king, or well, at least one of them, is a fighter. So, try to think about that. Richtig. Spartas Könige erhielten die doppelte Portion. Eine letzte Frage. Ab wann durften sich Spartiaten einen Bart stehen lassen? Ja, sobald ein Spartiat über 30 war, durfte er als prachtvolles Zeichen seiner Männlichkeit einen Bart tragen. Beeindruckend, du kannst stolz auf dich sein. Geh gut auf dich acht. So, here I've even unlocked a new character, Brasidas, famous general uh, of Sparta. So our uh, my present presentation come close to an end. Um, I just want to show you just very last few things. Uh, so there are 30 tours in that discovery tour. There are, uh, you can choose them either with a map, you can find them on the world, or you can choose them by subject. Uh, many of the, the tours that are the most appreciated are the one regarding daily life aspects, like winemaking, bronze making, uh, the, the silver mines on Laurium, for instance. So the more you do activities, the more you unlock rewards that are either historical characters like Archidamos, king of Sparta, or some fictive and funny characters uh, like this cultist with a traditional with a, a theater mask, or even the Minotaur <laughs> fraud. Um, you always have a timeline that you can refer to if you want, all of the elements that are on the timeline will get you into a tour, a related tour, for instance. So the Minoan civilization uh, or the uh, Mycenaean civilization or things like that. Uh, always there's, there are controls that people can go to. And one of the things that is very used often in school is the photo mode. So people can take 
pictures, they can modify them if they want. Uh, and a lot of teachers are using this to test their students, for instance. Uh, please go and see one specific place, for instance. So the students need to go there, they play the tours, but they also need to navigate and find one spot and take a picture. And so they can extract it easily from the game. And then they can do a presentation afterwards. So they can have uh, a discussion again, or they can do a research. So it's always just a mean to do something again. Same kind of thing that we've been doing with movies and books in many schools for a long time. But here, the ability is that you can go pretty much everywhere and you have a lot, a lot of freedom to see many things. So I do want to thank you for your attention. I will shut the game and we do have time for questions afterwards. So thank you very much.